All right, thank you so much for joining us today for this RCR Wireless News webinar on small cells, scalability, ROI, and the business case. I'm Kelly Hill, editor with RCR Wireless News, and I'd like to introduce you to our participants today. We are joined by Ian Gillett, who is president of IGR, Dave Mayo, SVP Technology at T-Mobile US, and Nick Johnson, CTO at IP Access. So welcome to all of our participants, and um, we're going to be digging into this topic of small cells, scalability, ROI, and the business case. Uh, we do have a special report that is going to be available um, hopefully later today at rcrwireless.com. Um, a few key takeaways from that report. Uh, Factors in the small cell business case include, there's a long list, um, these are some of them, geography, regulatory environment, uh, backhaul and power avail availability, the operator's competitive position and spectrum holdings in any given market, um, available tower and or uh, fiber company infrastructure. Um, so lots, obviously lots of factors and we'll be getting into some of the, into how some of those play into the, the equation today. Um, the industry has improved small cell CapEx and OpEx over the last couple of years, uh, but the space is still maturing in terms of the business case and ROI. Um, in the outdoor public small cell space, which I, I think it's fair to say is, is, is one of the most challenging use cases, um, small cells, uh, we see a lot of expectations across the industry that they're going to follow sort of a macro tower model of shared infrastructure, you know, neutral host uh, type of approach in order to be financially viable. Um, that's something I also expect uh, our, present, our presenters to get into a little bit, um, as well as uh, in our Q&A. Relationships and partnerships are key uh, to the finances and, uh, and time to market success of small cell deployments. And uh, we also looking ahead to LTE unlicensed technologies in various spectrum bands, um, you know, could radically change the small cell business case. So, um, so those are some of the key takeaways from that report, which will be available at, for free download at rcrwireless.com. Um, right now, we, I'm gonna hand it off to Ian, and he's gonna walk us through his presentation. And uh, so Ian, why don't you take it away? Great, thank you Kelly, and uh, good afternoon everybody. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, so I thought I would uh, actually start with a definition of small cells, and I think we may get into this a little bit more later on, but um, uh, the definition of small cells actually is pretty broad depending on who you are. And you do find that uh, different people define them differently depending on where they sit in the industry and uh, uh, what type of solutions they're providing. But we, uh, from our perspective, we look at everything from a Wi-Fi hotspot uh, through DAS. Uh, and within that as well, we would include uh, signal boosters, for example, for a basement or a, a parking garage or something like this. Uh, Femtocell, uh, obviously for a residential uh, solution. Um, a Pico cell is pretty much a, uh, we kind of, a femto cell on steroids, if you like, uh, but basically an indoor um, uh, enterprise or business class femto cell. Um, and you see those, uh, we're starting to see those enter the market now. Metro cell really gets into the outdoor space. Uh, this is something with a, a self-contained radio uh, and baseband and the antenna. And uh, you've seen obviously different solutions uh, mounted on poles, um, rooftops, etc. You can also take a remote radio head and deploy that as a small cell, and we've seen uh, we've seen that approach as well. Um, and then microcells going. Um, a microcell is really uh, it's almost like a uh, the tower equipment without the tower. Um, and then the last one on there is a macro cell, which uh, we don't include as a small cell. Uh, it is on a tower. Um, and obviously, you know, you know, we see we have these uh, plenty of these around right now. So in our definition, everything goes really from Wi-Fi all the way up to a microcell. Which, if you look at it, uh, basically, it's uh, anything that's not nailed to a tower. Um, and we do have a pretty broad uh, definition here, as I said. Other people have uh, narrower definitions. Uh, and I think as we get into the presentations today, uh, Dave is going to talk um, a lot more about the outdoor situation and what needs to happen there and I think Nick is going to get more into the indoor situation and the in, indoor um, uh, you know deployments and challenges there as well obviously a very different uh, market when you can't start considering an enterprise so your next slide uh, Kelly so uh, a couple of benefits here and I've got a couple of slides I thought summed it up this way so you know uh, let's talk about some of the obvious benefits here more bars um, quote unquote which obviously is how most consumers measure their experience um, or their anticipated experience on a, on a phone or a smartphone, whatever. They look at how many bars they've got. 
Um, and of course, we do have, uh, we've been doing this for a while now, um, this, this cellular thing. <laughs> um, but we still have places where, of course, we do have uh, uh, block signals and, uh, and coverage issues. Um, one of the things we found is that potentially an improved battery life for mobile devices. If a device is going in and out of coverage, the, the radio tends to hunt for a signal. Um, if it can stay locked on, then it can put itself into sleep mode and things like this. Um, so um, if the uh, phone goes into the hunting mode, if you like, then it is going to use the battery more often. Um, about half the battery life on a phone, actually, on a smartphone, actually goes into the screen. But actually, uh, about 20%, 25% actually goes into powering the radios for the various connections, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and, of course, LTE. Um, so it's not insignificant, uh, the difference there. Um, higher throughput and faster data connections for the subscribers. Obviously, if you're in a good area of coverage and you've got a small cell that's sitting there that's covering a small area, it's providing capacity in that area, then obviously you're going to get uh, pretty good throughput. Um, and then quality of experience for subscribers, including those on the macro cells. What really happens here is if you've got uh, um, a consumer you know, or maybe on the edge of a macro cell, um, if they can be handed off into a small cell environment in the outdoor or even an indoor, um, it could be in, a, in an office building, for example, we could hand off to the, an in-building solution. Um, that obviously is going to remove a user from the macro and leave more capacity there for the other people who are covered by that macro cell, uh, maybe driving through or, or whatever they're doing. So it's not just a case of benefiting the single uh, the small cell single user, let's say, but rather everybody else in that macro cell environment as well. It's kind of a ripple on effect. Um, uh, of course, we can, uh, we can do different technologies, um, things like in-building location, um, M2M, IoT. Uh, of course, if, if we've got a dedicated solution, for example, in a, an office building, some small cells inside, then we can put some uh, solutions dedicated to those cells that are not available perhaps on other, on other cells and do things like this. And then, of course, with the remote radio head, um, we can actually start to centralize the baseband um, and then start moving towards uh, cloud RAM architectures. Uh, I think most of the carriers now with, with LTE have used a remote radio head uh, type architecture on their macro cells. And that, of course, puts the baseband's at the bottom of the uh, tower in the, in the facilities there. That can be then centralized back to a uh, data center. It could even, the data center could even be at the bottom of the tower and then the small cells could connect into that as well. So, um, so there's improvements there that are, that are possible and obviously uh, um, are starting to emerge now. So we go to the next slide. So some of the cons here, um, I, uh, there's a couple there that kind of, I put the little uh, lightning bolts next to, and you know, the kind of takeaway here is that uh, <laughs> this makes it all expensive. Um, and that is the problem here, is that small cells are today relatively expensive to deploy compared to a macro cell on a tower um, when you look at uh, total capacity, coverage, et cetera, et cetera. And so really what I think the industry is going to be moving towards over the next few years is how do we address these issues, which I'll run through in a second, which will have the result of reducing the cost and making it uh, more viable. So firstly, uh, an uncertain uh, regulatory environment here. Uh, certainly, you've got to have comply with safety regulations. Uh, we don't want to be putting equipment on top of a, a street light, for example, that's uh, either not properly attached or um, uh, is not protected from the ground, from people interfering with it, et cetera, et cetera. There's also environmental and historic requirements. If you want to put something on the side of a building, um, if it's a protected building, um, then uh, you can have some issues there. I know that uh, a couple of years ago in, in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, trying to site small cells there, they actually had to make it look like part of the stonework on these older buildings. Um, obviously, you've got to manage multiple locations, new technologies. You have got to roll the trucks out um, uh, to put the things in. Uh, somebody has to go and take that box and nail it to a pole or nail it to a wall. Um, we don't want to be revisiting that, those locations every year. Um, we're talking about tens of thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of small cells here 
and obviously that the truck roll would cons uh, add significantly to the cost. So it's got to be kind of self-maintaining here. You've got a provision backhaul. We need to get the traffic off of the small cell back into the rest of the network. Um, that could be with fiber. Uh, it could be a wireless point-to-point -point solution. It could be point-to-multipoint. Uh, there's various ways to address that. Um, and um, certainly the need to comply with different zoning and aesthetic requirements. Uh, and the problem here, of course, is it varies enormously by location. Um, just looking at where I live in West Austin in Texas, you know, we've got the county, we've got the uh, our local village. Uh, then you're going to hit the city of Austin. You're going to hit the utility there, which is the city of Austin, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's probably four or five jurisdictions you're going to have to deal with just for uh, our small community west of Austin. Um, and, of course, they're all different depending on which market it is. And we certainly we've seen, um, you know, long lead times for getting uh, small cells approved and, employ and deployed, uh, and that's something that uh, we'll start to see hopefully getting addressed. Uh, coordination amongst the small cells and the macro cells, we want to do this with, to date. We've done this by a different spectrum, but with uh, the wonderful acronym EICIC, um, you can actually have a small cell sit within a macro coverage, and it will coordinate between the two of them uh, to minimize interference and obviously improve the throughput, the capacity. Uh, and then with remote radio head, you, need, you do need dark fiber for that, um, uh, for the cost and latency requirements, etc. You can get a microwave solution to work. Uh, some vendors have shown that. Uh, but typically, we see that remote radio head uh, dark fiber is in demand. So then the question becomes, well, where is the dark fiber? Is it available? How much is it going to cost to deploy uh, to the location I need? And I think the, the reason I show those two arrow, arrows there, the lightning bolts, is the two that are really um, causing issues today, if you like, uh, are the backhaul and the zoning and planning requirements. That seems to be what's slowing things down. Yes, you've got to power the small cell. Um, obviously, you've got to buy the equipment. You've got to put it in. All those things have to be done. But it's, uh, what seems to be um, delaying mass deployments are those two, those two factors more than the others. Um, uh, so with that, I think, uh, I think that was the last one of my slides. Okay, great. Um, we're going to move on to Dave Mayo. I do want to encourage our audience. Uh, there is a Q&A uh, interface through the webinar interface, so please feel free to submit your questions. Um, we'll be diving into Q&A after we get through all the presentations. So uh, with that, Dave, please uh, go ahead. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, first, I'm, so, I'm really glad to be here. I, for, and, and furthermore, I want to thank uh, members of the audience for all that, uh, that they've done to make this a great industry. Uh, the changes that the wireless industry have caused to society over the past 20 years are profound, and I expect the magnitude of these changes to continue over the coming decade as LTE becomes the predominant technology and 5G is rolled out to supplement capacity and to provide new services, particularly in densely populated areas. Uh, before I get into my, a couple of slides on the topic at hand, I want to if you want to flip to the next slide, Kelly, I want to do a little bit of a T-Mobile commercial. Uh, T-Mobile is a $35 billion market cap company. We've got 65 and a half million customers, uh, and that's up from just over 30 million three short years ago. We, have, we employ about 50,000 people. Uh, we have the fastest LTE network in the country, and I'm personally very proud of that. And we've maintained that fastest network uh, stature for nine consecutive quarters. Uh, we, we have two flagship brands, the T-Mobile brand and the Metro PCS brand. We, uh, we merged with Metro PCS uh, just over two years ago now and uh, are extraordinarily pleased with the results that that, uh, that, that piece of the business continues to deliver. Uh, if, I, if I look at where we are in 2016, we started out the, the year, I'll, I'll say on fire, with 2.2 uh, million net ads in the first quarter, of which a million of them were branded. Uh, 877,000 of those million, 1 million branded postpaid net, post net ads were uh, phone, new phone customers. And if you look at the industry, uh, the 877,000 represents about 200% of the net growth of the category, which grew only by about 450,000 customers. So real thrilled with the growth in the first quarter, um, but 
another thing we're, we're particularly thrilled with is the churn rate. Our churn rate on postpaid branded customers is down to 1.33%, signifying the solid impacts that our 700 megahertz LTE rollout and band 12 handset distribution strategy have, uh, have had. Uh, we cover 308 million Americans as of the end of the first quarter, and we've spent most of the last three years rolling out our LTE network. When I think back a couple of years, I remember asking or being asked about small cells and what, what I thought would happen. And I, you know, I, I, I can vividly remember thinking, gosh, I hope the duopolists are able to figure this one out before, before I have to start thinking about it because it's complicated. You know, uh, when I say mass deployment, I, I think about low cost, high volume, and speed of deployment. I, I, I kind of think about that as industrialization. You know, late last year, we began to begin to think about small cells. And frankly, I was pretty, pretty surprised by what I discovered, that the problem had not really been solved as it relates to, you know, out, outdoor deployments. You know, I'm going to principally talk about outdoor, but I'd, I'd uh, uh, talk a little bit. Uh, I just mentioned that we do have, going back to Ian's definition of small cells, uh, pretty active programs to uh, deploy DAS networks in venues, as well as the, uh, the in-home coverage solutions that we've deployed hundreds of thousands of to our customers. And I guess those are small cells by by definition, but I think that's kind of outside of what I really wanted to focus on today. If you want to flip to the next slide, Kelly. Yeah, well, so let's talk a little bit about where we are. You know, LTE is pretty cool because it gives us the tools to very precisely target the distribution of traffic across a sector. So um, this is much different than what the tools we had available in UMPS and GSM. And the chart to the left really describes the traffic on a cell site. The dark colors represent the intensity of traffic, and the circles, the blue circles, represent um, six small cells that were designed in this in in the three sectors of this cell site. And those three, those sorry, those six small cells will offload approximately 50% of the traffic on the uh, on the macro site today. You know, historically, we would have att attempted to solve, you know, the congestion on or the potential congestion and that traffic uh, on the uh, macro site with cell splits. You know, typically cell splits cost between in an urban area between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars in capital, and you know, something in the order of five forty forty five hundred to five fifty five hundred dollars in in operating costs, albeit rent, backhaul, and utilities. Um, the right side of the slide represents one of our initial small cells that we built uh, last year. That, uh, that particular site is backhauled with microwave, uh, which we, we felt was the fastest way to get kind of get out of the gate and start experimenting with small cells. Uh, it cost us under $35,000, and, and we'll spend about $200 a month in operating costs on that site. Um, but the cool thing is, is it took about 35% of the traffic off the sector that, uh, that it's beneath. You know, we believe that over time we can consistently drive the capital costs to well under $20,000 a small cell and OPEX to under th uh, 350 utilizing a fiber-based solution. You know, it's going to take time to get there, but I think that's, that's a, I think that's a, a target we'd like to achieve. On the the next slide, Kelly, talk, we'll talk a little talk a little bit about kind of the radio solutions and how they've evolved and will evolve over the course of uh, the balance of the decade. Um, you know, radio technology is miniaturized to the point that small cells are now a reality for outdoor application. Um, we have two radio vendors, and their solutions are now small enough to provide enough capacity to really uh, be considered uh, viable offload strategies. Um, each of the solutions is roughly the size of uh, a, a two slice toaster. So they're not very big, but the, the capacity and the uh, capability of those products is, is really cool. One of the products is effectively a remote radio head. So, the, so that separation of the radio from the baseband. And as Ian mentioned earlier, that's a, uh, 
that rate that radio head will effectively carry the traffic and then the baseband functionality is centralized at a at a, at a near, nearby site uh, the other solution which is perfectly acceptable is an integrated solution that contains both the baseband and the radio at the site you know over time i'd expect more and more uh, remote radio heads be deployed as uh, the technology allows and affords us the ability to better uh, manage interference between the macro site and the small cell. Uh, you know, beginning next year, we expect to be deploying uh, small cells that have the capability to support both licensed and unlicensed spectrum. And we're excited about this because it'll create uh, an opportunity for vast amount of capacity for our data hungry customers. In, as we approach the end of the decade, you know, it, it's, you know, it's clear that the locations that we're deploying and will be deploying small cells in today will be those locations where 5G will be, you know, initially deployed in utilizing millimeter wave frequencies like 28, 38 gigahertz. And if you want to go into the last slide, Kelly, you know, industrialization of the solutions required you know, I, 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 Ian alluded to this, but I think we've got to get to the point where we've, we, we've, we, we can deploy at, at, at what I describe as scale. And that's going to require us to think differently about things. Uh, we can't get to scale uh, with a one site at a, site at a time approach. You know, the industry has been built, you know, tens and tens of thousands of sites for each of the operators, one site at a time. And I don't think we can at all take the same approach with small cells. We need to think about ways that we acquire, zone, permit, permit, and construct differently than what we do today, as it takes several quarters for this process to occur in an urban area, and that's simply not acceptable or going to be scalable. So we have to think differently about deployments, and, and differently in terms of every facet of the process in terms of the way it works. I've listed a few thoughts and ideas about partnerships with municipalities, which I believe are going to be critical. That said, I believe then that, uh, that you know, working with jurisdictions is gonna be tremendously important uh, because they, you know, any reasonable jurisdiction is gonna want a high quality service for their constituents. But I think it's gonna take work to explain and, and uh, help the, the, the jurisdictions understand how we're going to do things in a non-intrusive way, um, and and frankly, one size is not going to work for everyone. For every one of the operators, we're all going to have different, slightly different, and, and in some cases, radically different approaches to the way we deploy. Uh, that said, I think it's going to be important and incumbent for us as an industry to not do things that infuriate citizens or city planners. Uh, we've got to help educate and we've got to find solutions that are non-intrusive. Uh, at T-Mobile, we built a website to help educate folks as to the need for additional sites and particularly small cells. Uh, the site is located at www.howmobileworks.com. Again, I'd, I'd reiterate the importance of finding creative ways to the siting issue and, and realize that scale is really important. It has to be an important element to uh, to the solution and with that kelly i'll pass it along okay great thanks dave you know i think that's a really a really good point you know part of this uh, the, making the finances work for small cells really is i think as you said about industrialization and and the scalability that goes along with that um, so with that we are going to hear from nick johnson of ip access uh, so nick why don't you go ahead Hey, thanks, Kelly. Uh, this is uh, Nick Johnson. I'm CTO and uh, founder of IP Access. Uh, just a slide here of introduction on IP Access itself, and then uh, and, and of me. Um, the, uh, so we are, we are a small cell vendor. Actually, we were, we've been a small cell vendor before they were even called small cells. So we we started uh, building this stuff really at the end of '99. Uh, and I'm honoured to say actually that T-Mobile US was actually our, our first deployment in GSM back in 2003. So. Uh, Dave, thank you very much. We've been, yeah. a, um, <laughs> been a journey. Very happy. <laughs> it, it certainly has. Um, 
so uh, and and we've we've come a long way from that from those early GSM beginnings. We've 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 got a 3G um, portfolio and LTE as well um, for the last few years, and both access points and gateways. So we're we're a RAM specialist focused on enterprise and indoor, so the other end of the market, to Dave, the one Dave was describing. Um, and we're based in the UK, and we have a development center in Pune, India, I think, as, as most uh, engineering companies do. There's a, usually a, 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 a development center out there somewhere. Um, and we also have a support uh, center in Bellevue, Washington, funnily enough, not very far from uh, Factoria headquarters of T-Mobile HQ. <laughs> uh, and we're about 150 people all in. Uh, across those three sites. Um, myself, I've, I've, I've been in the business from the very beginning. Um, so in terms of credentials, I've been uh, the Small Cell Forum, which was founded as the Femto Forum in 2007. Um, I've been, I was the founding chair of the Radio and Physical Layer Working Group in that forum. Uh, I'm just passing that on now. Uh, so I've been, been doing that for quite a long time. Uh, and I have a PhD in microwave imaging going back uh, even further. Um, embarrassing to say how far how long ago that really was um, and of course uh, most important qualification of all I'm a terribly nice chap so um, the, that's, um, I find that most important thing uh, in my in my uh, resume and um, next slide please Kelly so yeah we, we uh, in terms of I couldn't I couldn't agree more with what Dave said about uh, industrialization or of scaling of the small cell deployments I think you know, if we if we continue to do these things one cell at a time um, we'll be here since, till doomsday, uh, and no one wants that. So we have a particular, um, and, and we see an awful lot of pent-up demand for small cells, for cellular coverage inside buildings of various sorts, of, uh, various sorts. And a lot of that fueled by vertical markets who need a scalable um, solution that has, um, that from, a, from a, uh, an enterprise point of view, is not necessarily dedicated to an operator. It may be uh, it may be a neutral host, so it may be you may have a, a host neutral aspect, but it also may be a multi-operator angle as well. So um, we find it we think it's very important that we we are um, designing and engineering a, a solution which is deployable by enterprises themselves uh, and can be uh, dedicated to an operator can operate in their license spectrum. Um, can actually serve subscribers from any operator, so can provide a multi-operator solution in that respect, um, but also can operate in the newly emerging. Uh, uh, so Dave alluded to, uh, and Ian before him alluded to LTEU and LAA. Um, and we also see emerging spectrum at 3.5 gigahertz as well with the CBRS initiative um, from the FCC that, that was um, uh, defined by a rule and order back in April 2015, actually that's starting to become uh, a, a, a relevant uh, aspect of new spectrum uh, and new, new licensing spectrum. So that's, that's going to be intrinsically shared from the get-go, um, but even so with some licensing attached. So there's a sort of a lease, uh, like a wireless DHCP attached to that spectrum, which we see is very exciting um, to allow enterprises to deploy their own uh, coverage and capacity um, and act as a uh, uh, essentially a, an extension to the mobile operator's own networks without having to um, worry about um, uh, the spectrum access itself. So I think we see that as a very important aspect. Um, virtualizing all of that so the whole thing can be deployed as a um, within a data center again, so uh, simplifying the deployment can be operated as a, as a service, so reducing the capex burden on on operators and and, and other other parties in, in there, and a range of small cells really to suit the application. So whatever wave band that is, or whether it's um, FDD or TDD for these new um, new licensing uh, new license spectrum. So we're quite uh, really focusing on the flexibility and the de deployability of this um, from a uh, you know, from an engineering point of view. Then if we have a look at the, the um, next slide, we can see a little bit more about how that works. So traditionally we see you know, the um, cells being deployed for multi-operator, one cell per operator. Um, and we're looking, we're collapsing that down now so that a single cell can then provide uh, enterprise coverage for vertical markets then through, through one piece of spectrum, which may be donated by an operator or may be part of this uh, CBRS spectrum or or 5.8 or 5 gigahertz spectrum operated as a uh, in a multifier mode, potentially standalone LTE mode, uh, 
uh, going forward. Uh, and then the, the gateways itself themselves being collapsed down to a single device in a, new, in a hosted environment then that um, really then uh, simplifies that deployment model. And uh, all, the, all the while there, extending the reach of the mobile operator. At the end of the day, the, op the mobile operator is the, um, you know, is the customer, the ultimate customer of this. So helping them in their mission to improve the network performance, to reach, improve their reach to their customers. Um, in in the in the you know difficult environment that we all face ourselves in, so you know, Dave is Dave is almost unique in 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 the mobile operator um, community in that you know that if you look at the financial performance of mobile operators um, over the last five years, more more mobile operators are, are earning less money than, now than they were five years ago, and I think T-Mobile is a notable exception to that. But as a general rule, the mobile operator business is a tough one, and, and we as vendors have to work very hard to help them get the best out of the, the way they spend their capex and opex. And so this is this is our our um, contribution, if you like, to that to that story. Um, and then so the, the next slide then really looks at the commercial aspects of this. How does this work commercially? And um, so again, we can operate this in a in an opex funded model where. A neutral host actually buys the equipment and deploys it and manages it on behalf of the operator, uh, and then you know so that the the operator or the end user is actually um, you know there's a, there's an opex relationship between that um, neutral host de um, deployer. So this this is kind of extending the um, the tower tower co uh, model into small cells, uh, and this is this is a model that's really sort of emerging I think in in the industry. Many of the telcos who have made a successful business about operating um, macro shared infrastructure over the years are looking to small cells now to understand how they can extend that model. Um, and certainly within the um, metro small cells that, that Dave was describing, but also looking about how they can do that in the same um, in the same way within enterprise and indoor um, small cells as well. And of course, the enterprise themselves can fund that as well. They you know that with their Pent up demand. Many of them are quite happy to actually buy the infrastructure uh, to support extended service uh, in in their in their uh, venues and facilities, uh, and this model works for them very well as well. So, really, we're 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 playing our part as far as we can in in extending the mobile operators' reach, extending their capacity, faced with essentially flat revenues across the industry. But with a continuing sort of 65% compound growth in data demand um, that that we see, you know, continuing year after year after year, you know, that unremitting pressure from the customer demand, there has to be some some new ways to to make this whole economic. So in terms of making the return on investment work for small cells, you know, actually sharing the infrastructure of small cells seems to me a very important uh, way of doing that, and and uh, so that that's. That's the that's our message for today. Um, I am going to um uh, ask our our present our presenters if they can give us each uh, sort of their definition of what is a small cell. As Ian alluded to, um, those are uh, definitions that sometimes need some some common ground. Um, so, uh, Ian, um, when you talk about small cells in today's context, it sounds like it's pretty much everything short of macros. Yeah, if, uh, actually, very simple definition. If it's not nailed to a tower, it's a small cell. And the reason we adopted that. Uh, definition and we, we started that from when we started doing our research on this gosh three four five years ago now I think um, it's because it really wasn't clear what was going to be deployed where and you could have a variety of different solutions um, so it could be on a pole it could be on a building site it could be a remote radio head it could be a microcell it could be in building it could be operated by an enterprise it could be operated by an operator um, <laughs> so uh, we didn't want to, to be honest, we didn't want to paint ourselves into a corner. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, there's nothing worse, you know, than uh, defining things as an SUV and then along comes a crossover and it's not an SUV, it's a minivan or something, yeah. right? Um, okay. So yeah, that's why we did it. <laughs> so. Okay. 
Um, and uh, Nick, uh, when you talk about small cells, uh, you know, in what context are you discussing them? Yeah, I, I guess we follow a party line really late. So the small cell forum itself has a, a categorization of small cells into four major groups. So we, we talk about um, residential for small cells, which used to be called femtos. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about enterprise small cells. Uh, we talk about rural and remote small cells. And that really, that really categorizes the backhaul, really, rather than the cell itself. So we're looking at you know, satellite backhaul or you know, long, uh, long haul backhaul of one sort or another, where the delays are very, very significant. Um, and also urban and, and, and uh, metro type uh, small cells, where they're you know, higher power class, but uh, um, deployed on uh, you know, outdoors predominantly. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that that has, and predominantly, you know, the Small Cell Forum has, has been mainly a licensed spectrum uh, model over the years. Yes. We, and uh, so we we don't tend to think of Wi-Fi as small cells, although you know, as we as we know that may, most operators um, have some kind of Wi-Fi play, uh, over you know the, using Wi-Fi to carry their service as a as a as a method. So. You know, it is, it is a, it's an academic point, really, I think, whether, whether Wi-Fi is a small cell or not, um, since, since operators provide service over it, I guess it is. Um, <laughs> but small cell forum itself concerns, it, concerns itself mainly with license radio technology. Okay. Um, but as I, that, that border is blurring as we get into LTEU and um, CBRS as, as time goes forward. Absolutely. And, uh, and Dave, when you talk about small cells, um, you know, do you have a particular definition in mind? <laughs> oh, this is classic. So, no, a tool in the toolbox to coverage, uh, to solve a coverage or capacity problem that's not a macro. I okay. Mean, we've got gas uh, nodes, thousands of them that principally were acquired from Metro PCS that really built their network in the metropolitan areas around, uh, around distributed antennas. You know, the in-home that I referred to earlier, the outdoor that I spent a lot of time talking about, spent a little bit of time talking about venues, and, you know, gosh, we were pioneers on Wi-Fi, and those are, by definition, small cells. Okay. Great. So um, I, I want to take a question from our audience uh, that I think is several of you referred to, um, and I, I think it's a, a good um, a good jumping off point, is, is uh, do you think small cells will help IoT? Uh, because I think when we start talking about the small cell business case, um, there are some very, there's some, some very interesting potential there when it comes to IoT specific uh, you know, support or um, or enablement, um, you know, and 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 monetization and, and ROI ultimately goes along with that. Um, Ian, I don't know if you want to start since I, I know you specifically referenced that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's um, uh, it's a good question. Um, the answer is, I think it, <laughs> it's the classic. It depends if it's <laughs> the tra well, if, if if you're looking at a transportation vertical for IoT, so long haul trucking containers. Uh, monitoring um, drivers, those types of things. Then, then no, we just need a we need a broad coverage across a very wide area to make sure the truck is always in coverage. And I'm not sure small cells really going to help there. Now you contrast that with something like uh, home security or home healthcare, doing some monitoring of an elderly person or monitoring a property. Then it may help to have uh, a small cell, probably a femto cell, in that location to provide a dedicated uh, connection that's not relying on Wi-Fi or broadband, for example, um, uh, in, in that situation. So I think the answer is it's, it really is, what are you trying to do? Um, it's not a case of, gosh, you know, I need IoT, therefore I'm gonna put small cells in. I don't think that's the case. It's the other way around. It's, I've got this IoT solution now, how am I gonna connect it to the rest of the network? Okay. Um, Nick? Do you want to weigh in on, on thoughts on IoT in, in yeah, enterprise? Uh, I do. I think the, 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 the Internet of Things, I think, is a, is a very broad church. Um, you know, when the, the sort of the, the, the reflex re response to you when you think of IoT, you think of sensor networks and, and very low bit rate, um, but, but highly reliable um, you know, tran trans, uh, transactions. Um, but you also have um, uh, video you know, um, security systems that, that are actually interested in transferring quite large amounts of data from uh, security cameras and so on. And so uh, the, you know, the, the NBIoT stuff that's, that's part of release 13 is very, very much focused on the first of those, the, the low bit rate um, uh, transactional stuff. 
Uh, and the, the air interface is designed to be very narrow band, very, very low noise floor, um, very, you know, very wide dynamic range, great link budget. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can actually get a very long way with, with a, um, uh, with, with a with a given radio signal, and of course that that's desirable because you want things that are battery powered and and can last for years on a single cell. So um, that and and in that situation, you know you 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 do want to keep the the the, the propagation path uh, manageable. So macro cells are fine, but there are also some when you've got very dense networks of sensors, which I think we will, we we are all expecting in this space then you've also got some very deep shadows in, in macro coverage that the simulations won't necessarily tell you about. And you'll find that um, macro cells will be, will be great for the wide area coverage, as, as Ian says, but there are going to be places where actually you want a combination of small cell uh, NB-IoT and regular LTE coverage to give you the reliable sort of 100% coverage of, of dense sensor networks some of which may be in macro fades, um, and you also want the ability to transfer those um, chunks of data that you need when you need them in terms of security and, and um, uh, uh, health monitoring, for instance, if you're concerned about the, the uh, mobility of, a, of an elder or, or so on that you, you really want to see you want to see how they're doing, you, you want to be able mm -hmm. to transfer reasonable chunks of data in that, in that, in that sort of Internet of Things scenario. So, Small cells definitely have a role, I think. Um, the, the macro, is, macro is the starting point for IoT, uh, NB-IoT mm -hmm. especially, and, um, but I think small cells will definitely have a role. Uh, Dave, do you have thoughts on this as well? No, I think, I think the guys have really described it pretty well. I mean, I think it's, a, it's an augment. It can't, uh, you can't, it, it, it's not an end to a means. Okay. Um, well, we do have questions for you um, mentioning that T-Mobile deploys Wi-Fi access points for Wi-Fi calling, signal boosters, and small cells. Um, can you describe how all these fit together? How all they, how they fit? How they all fit together. I, I, you know, gosh, uh, you know, we're pretty simple guys. We just want to provide cust great customer, a great product to our customers. And, you know, I think as we've evolved, we, we started off, you know, going back uh, almost a decade now with Wi-Fi and really trying to build a Wi-Fi platform to help us with our with, with coverage. You know, folks remember we didn't have low band spectrum until fairly recently. Mm -hmm. we really built the business on a mid band grid, and that provided, you know, frankly a challenge on you know, indoor coverage. But uh, you know, as we've rolled out uh, our low band frequencies, we've seen. You know significant improvements of coverage you know in residential areas and we'll continue to do that over the coming coming quarters uh, you know each one of those solutions that you described was geared to solve a particular customer pain point uh, the repeater works really well in places where we've got you know you're kind of on the edge of the edge of coverage and but you mm -hmm. can't quite get there yeah. but you don't have a broadband signal right Whereas the, uh, the, the Femto site that we've, uh, I guess we launched a little bit over a year ago now is a great solution if you've got a broadband, if you've got broadband coverage in your home, just plug the thing in and you're off and running and the cost, the price point of that product is, uh, is, is, is great. And frankly, we've been giving it away to our customers for a, you know, and all the customers have to do is provide a small deposit so that we know we get it back. Mm -hmm. So okay. each one of them is a, a little bit of a unique tool to, to solve a, 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 each a different pain point, you know, over each developed at, you know, very different times in the, in the, in the lifespan of the company. Okay. Um, we did have a question from the audience uh, who said, I understand a macro site takes about two years um, to turn up onto the network, uh, you know, from start to finish. What's the current timeline for an outdoor small cell and what specific actions are being taken to shorten these timeframes? Um, I wanted to, to just, uh, you know, say as I was doing the research for this report, um, you know, Crown Castle had some interesting things to say. Um, it, it said that they that it took that it generally takes them uh, 18 to 24 months to build a brand new system. Um, so, you know, they have a pipeline of projects that are in the works, and I think you're starting to see more and more of those come online now. Um, you know, and, and that's for for new tenants. Now, one of the things I also thought was interesting was that, um, you know, for co-location, and this might be, you know 
utilizing the same fiber run, but, you know, maybe different poles or, you know, or sometimes the same poles, um, you know, they said, you know, that process, um, you know, can take anywhere between nine months and 18 months, depending on the dynamics in the market. Uh, you know, so I think, you know, depending on whether you're a first mover and, you know, in time to market, um, you know, is different, um, you know, whether you're, you're co-locating or a first mover, um, you know, and so there are some, I think a lot of the, the pipeline is open, I would say, um, you know, and I think that from here on out, we'll probably see more and more projects come online, you know, as people move through the regulatory process and all the approvals that they need, you know, getting the fiber in the ground, um, you know, where it's needed. And, uh, and, and I think co-location is probably going to become easier as time goes along. Ian, I don't know if you have any particular thoughts uh, on that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's those, um, uh, I think Fran Shamo is a CFO of Verizon. He said a few months ago, uh, some investor conference, um, that, you know, it was taking about 24 months or so for small cell deployments. Um, and, you know, so the next question, of course, is well, what takes so long, right? I mean, it takes about a couple of a day or so to put one up. <laughs> um, and it is the planning, the zoning, it's permissions. Um, and it's also getting the backhaul in if you're using fiber. Um, I mean, if you want to go dig up, you know, downtown Austin, for example, and put some fiber in, it's going to take a while um, to get permission to do that. Um, and so you do see different companies uh, putting in massive fiber bundles, um, uh, kind of a build it and they will come strategy anticipating there's going to be demand in urban areas for, for dark fiber and making sure it's available wherever the smelt the cell needs to go. Um, it's kind of a speculative type approach, but, um, you know, certainly it works to cut down on that process. So could we see the situation where once you've got permission, maybe you've got uh, working with utility, you've got uh, permission, you're know, going on their right of way or whatever you're doing, that a deployment then after that only takes a few months. Yeah, I think we could get there, but we're not there yet. Um, it takes some time. I know Dave's had more experience with this than uh, probably any of us. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd echo that. I, I think you, you, you kind of hit it spot on. I mean, the, the, the illustration that I showed you um, on the slides with microwave, I think it took us from start to finish on that particular site. It was about a four or five month process. But uh, we didn't rip street. You know, there was no fiber deployment per se. And you know, I, I'd say in the in the deployments that we've begun, and frankly, we just we're just getting started. Um, you know, we started contracting right at the end of the year, and you know, we'll see we'll see we'll see some some cities with some I'll say some fairly significant deployment this year. Um, so you know, I I think when you when you first enter a market with a with a fiber provider. You know, it's it's a year, 18 months, but I think the cool thing is that once you get that initial tarantula fiber laid, I think the ability to deploy incremental sites off of that will be significantly decreased. And I think that as we develop and build on our relationships with the municipalities, I think it'll be, e that process will be easier as well. So I, you know, I'd say maybe a year, 18 months, right out of the shoots, and that's from contracting all the way to on air, uh, with a significant. You always have, you know, the stragglers, but with a significant number in in a given market. Um, and then, at, you know, once you get beyond that, you know, I'm expecting that this is this is a a process that takes days, not weeks and months. Okay. Great. Um, we do have a question that, that I think is an interesting one uh, that comes up frequently in this context, and that is, how do you see small cells, DAS, and Wi-Fi being used for indoor coverage? Are there any specific use cases or venues where one fits better than the other, or is cost the primary reason for using one solution over the others? Um, typically, what I hear when I pose this kind of question to folks is that, well, you know, it's all part of the toolbox, and it's really a, a a venue by venue or deployment by deployment equation. Um, you know, uh, you know, and obviously there's a mix, um, you know, there's, there's a difference, uh, you know, Wi-Fi is very, um, has very high penetration in the enterprise, um, you know, DAS in, in large venues often makes uh, economic sense, uh, particularly when you have, um, you know, neutral host situations. Um, you know, uh, would you folks like to, to weigh in on sort of that DAS small cells Wi-Fi e equation and, uh, and, you know, how those, things get approached? 
I, I'd love to. <laughs> Great. Um, you know, I, I'd love to see a world where we're deploying small cells in venues and not having to go on tremendously expensive distributed antenna systems. I mean, the, those systems are, you know, it's kind of the old way of doing things. And frankly, it came out of an era that preceded the miniaturization of electronics that I described in my presentation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's tools in the toolbox now that are much more cost effective to use than DAS. The unfortunate part that is that we've got a, a, a collection of venue owners and property managers that don't really understand those tools. And I think over time, you know, the, the we as an industry need to educate them that there is there are other ways to skin the cat short of just using, uh, you know, the technology that's been around for 10 years. Okay. Um, Nick, we, did, we had a question from an audience member. Um, how do you see companies expanding use of small cells in their buildings and campuses? Um, and since you specifically talked a lot about the indoor, uh, the indoor applications, I wondered if you might be able to, uh, you know, to, to address that. Yeah, okay. Um, so how do we, let me check on just to the question, how do enterprises uh, expand their coverage in their buildings? Was that did yeah, I, that you, correctly? I mean, do you see companies, you know, doing this in building, you know, using small cells on campuses, um, you know, and, uh, you know, just your perspective on, on that? Yeah, so, so the, um, from a, so there's a, there's a, a range of enterprises that, that are, if you look at the demographics of enterprises in any, almost any country, they, they follow a very similar curve and, and 90 percent of or over 90 percent of um and end of premises i should say not enterprises but but premises are less than 20 or 30 people um and you know, in any uh, so for enterprises that they they're actually deploying a a single small cell or, or a small number of small cells is a very very um viable option to to serve their own their own uh coverage needs um, typically the, um, the the big venues the camp what you might call a campus or a, a big um, uh, venue then then often gets you know gets a, a, a metro cell solution of some sort of, uh, to do that and then that's very often um, done by the by the operator themselves um, but we saw in our in our um, residential femto solution um, that we did through through Cisco to AT and T that we um, we would see many of those residential small cells being deployed by small enterprises um, to improve their indoor coverage um, for their for their staff and you know that was a that was a closed access sort of restricted user group solution but then you know the modern small cells modern small cells are open access and you know we see that being um, deployed in much more general. Um, uh, uh, for, for general coverage improvements there. Um, but again, it is still predominantly operator deployed. We, we, the, we, we are still at, a, at the beginning of a journey where to get the scale of these things, um, uh, you know, we, need to, we need to scale up the, the workforce, if you like, who's able to deploy these things. And that really means enlisting the, operate, enlisting the enterprises themselves in doing that deployment. Very much like Wi-Fi, you know, we have the tools, um, you know, the self-organisation tools for the RF. We have the, um, you know, the customers have their own backhaul for for that is um, broad enough to carry significant amounts of LTE data. And so the the backhaul for enterprises in particular, the the backhaul and the the radio environments are are well suited to to self-deployment. And the technology itself is getting to the point where it's you know it's advanced enough that the self-organisation can happen. Um, you know, within within the rules that are set by the host operator, uh, in a very um, you know in, in a very safe and predictable and and repeatable and scalable way, and you know we're starting to see examples of that uh, around the world. Okay. Uh, in, um, great. We had one question, and I think I, I'd like to, I'd like each of you to, to give thoughts on this, since I think um, all of you referenced it in one way or another. Um, the question from the audience was, is unlicensed spectrum the answer, the answer for data demands? And I would sort of like to piggyback on that and ask your thoughts about what unlicensed spectrum will mean for small cells. You have, um, you know, obviously a lot of interest in both uh, in a bunch of different flavors of uh, LTE and unlicensed, uh, whether that's LAA, LWA, uh, LTEU. Um, you, we have uh, 
we had several mentions of the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum. Um, and Google, I believe, is already starting to build a trial system, I want to see in downtown Kansas City, I believe, um, uh, that they recently got permissions for, and that will be small cell based. Um, you know, there's some uh, interesting, uh, you know, propagation characteristics when you start talking about some of those, uh, you know, five gigahertz, 3.5, you know, that make it, um, you know, most likely, I think, to be small cell implementations. And then, of course, as you, um, you know, as you think about the potential to leverage uh, unlicensed, whether that's even standalone, um, as uh, Multifire was mentioned, um, you know, that, that perhaps makes a very interesting enterprise option as well. Um, so, uh, you know, Ian, maybe you can start us off and, uh, and talk a little bit about how you see that potentially playing into the small cell business case. Well, I'm going to use the uh, uh, Dave's toolkit term. To me, unlicensed is, is just another piece of the toolkit. I do not believe it's the answer. Um, I, I, you know, the way LTEU and the other flavors of, of taking LTE and putting it into the unlicensed bands is the way they work is basically say, okay, I'm going to use carrier aggregation and I'm going to, I, need a, I need another two megahertz, let's say, or need another five megahertz to build a complete channel. Um, I don't have it available right now in my license band, so I'm just going to go borrow it from the unlicensed, uh, 2.4, 5, you know, et cetera. Um, and I'm literally going to do that. I'm going to borrow it. I'm going to use it while I need it to use it. Um, if, uh, if my license bands become available, I'll go back to those. Um, but I don't see that we're going to get a huge number of small cells deployed, for example, that only use unlicensed spectrum. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, anybody who lives in New York City, uh, I'm going next week, you know, you just turn off Wi-Fi when you land. <laughs> there's, 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 five hot, there's five hot spots on every corner, and none of them you can get on. They're either private, they're password protected, or they are overloaded mm -hmm. and slow. I mean, go to Starbucks in, in Manhattan, and, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's tough getting on the Wi-Fi because the other million people sitting around you, you're also using it. Um, and L LTE, you know, it's using the same bands. It it's unlicensed. Um, yes, you can put some, some protocols on there to control the quality of the experience, but you're still using an unlicensed band. So and I think we always have to remember this. It's not a case of, gosh, you know, we carriers don't need any more licensed spectrum anymore. Let's just run off into 2.4 and 5 gig. I don't think you'll see that at all. I think it's, think of it more as I need to borrow this little bit of spectrum for a time to build my complete channel to do what I need to do. And then after that, I'm going to release it. Um, and so I think it's, it's complementary. It's part of the toolkit. It is not the answer. It is one part of the answer. Okay. Nick, uh, <laughs> right? Nick, your thoughts? Yeah, so, so I totally agree. So, so, that, you know, there is a sort of um, PC answer to to Wi-Fi, and we, we we like to say, well, Wi-Fi is just just you know it, it's it's as good as um, you know as LTE, but actually it isn't. I mean, I think you know, Ian, you just you just hit the nail on the head. You know, Wi-Fi just does not handle congestion very well compared to LTE, and it's all it's, there's a lot of technical detail behind it. But the schedule, the Mac scheduler, is the key that actually Wi-Fi is is contended and. Uh, collision sense and LTE is scheduled. So it, it is actually a better technology for managing congested networks. And so I think in those situations where you've got a very dense, um, uh, you know, a very high traffic demand and you need to, you know, you need to move beyond um, the spectrum you have available in your license bands, then you are going to put LTE in some other spectrum. And, that, you know, again, echoing what Ian said, you don't, you're not going to need it the whole time, but you, you may well need it for, for long periods of the busy hour, um, and you know, leasing it on you know, the the CBRS model of leasing it there is going to be a, a very important one, mm -hmm. um, especially when you're able to you know, with carrier aggregation, you can actually put a put a, a second carrier, you can lease a second carrier yes. um, in that space in a very flexible way. So your your primary carrier may well be in a licensed spectrum. Um, but then you're you're managing overload by by leasing some some 3.5 spectrum. I think the five gigahertz band for LTEU I think is you know there's such a even though the, the quality of experience over Wi-Fi is very poor I think the 
um, you know, for, there is so much embedded technology there. And, and for the most part, you know, if you're uh, out of the metro um, centers, if you're in an enterprise, yeah, Wi-Fi is just the default technology and, and that's going to continue to use, be used. So I don't mm -hmm. think, I, I think LTEU itself, um, you know, has a place. And of course it, it, it uh, but, but I think actually the, 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 the way of using um, a shared access license spectrum, you know, LSA in Europe or, or CBRS in, in the US is going to be the dominant way of doing it. Okay. Uh, Dave, any final thoughts for us on the use of LTE uh, or just unlicensed spectrum in the small cell context? Yeah, I think, uh, look, if you look at either the, uh, the Cisco or the Ericsson expectations of growth in mobile usage and the, the, the degree to which the networks are going to be taxed, you know, operators are going to be looking for every possible way and LAA, LTU, all pose an opportunity to create offload. So sure, they'll, you know, we'll use everything, every tool we can possibly use and find in the toolbox to, uh, to help meet, meet those customer needs. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, all of our participants. Um, we really appreciated having you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, folks.